we are using it for nanoparticles here. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, so uh, we really have uh, now virtual populations. <laughs> uh, so the next talk is going to be given by Mr. Sicardi, He's, who is from Liverpool but actually from, more from Italy born. And he is talking about a physiologically based pharmacokinetic model to predict the superparamagnetic iron oxide nanoparticles accumulation in vivo. So here we have the particles and here we can see if we can also do that in modeling. So it, it's actually quite, quite nice to follow up from, from the previous presentation that, uh, 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 where it was given such a nice overview of the modeling approach. And, and today I'm going to just try to describe our latest uh, 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 findings on the use of PBPK to try and predict nanoparticle distribution in, in animals and humans. So this field is still quite in, a, in its infancy and there aren't so many uh, uh, PBPK uh, uh, models published out there for nanoparticle. So I will start from the fact that nanoparticle distribution is the result of a lot of different processes, complex processes that we have been seeing before. So we can have different route of administration uh, 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 as well as different mechanism uh, regulating penetration in tissues and eliminations. So what we try to do with PEPK uh, is actually to try and give a mathematical representation of all these in order to predict accumulation in tissues and, uh, and other PK parameters for traditional drugs as well as for nanoparticles. So what we have, we have a network of, of uh, uh, differential equations describing the movement, for example, of uh, tablets and nanoparticles, if given for all administration through the stomach, small intestine, then penetration through the intestinal wall, and then diffusion through the systemic circulation, <laughs> uh, through different organs, uh, and then what actually PBPK give us the possibility to do is not just using uh, fitted parameters, but actually developing experimental data that can be included in our model in order to try and predict PK. So we can run a specifically design experiment, for example, to measure apparent permeability uh, through the intestinal monolayer using CACO2 cells. Uh, or if we have information related to the size of the nanoparticle in charge, we can make them as some assumptions related to penetration through the capillary fenestration, for example. And then it, we can run experiments to uh, uh, measure macrophage uh, uptake, as has been described before, uh, uh, and then potentially predict the accumulation in, in, in organ and tissues such as the liver, the spleen, and the lungs. Then we can use this mathematical framework to then make some assumptions related to potential bioavailability, distribution and clearance of nanoparticles. And if, if we have information related to uh, con a relation between nanoparticle concentration and uh, toxicity or, or efficacy, we can then uh, design specifically scenarios such as development of nova formulation, the findings of, of those in animals in humans, uh, and, and perhaps uh, some nanotoxicology studies. So what we used in, uh, in this specific project is actually a, sp a spion, superparamagnetic uh, uh, iron oxide nanoparticle in, co in collaboration uh, uh, with the uh, University of Santa Catarina in Florianopolis uh, uh, in Brazil. Uh, and the, the aim of our study was to try and, and create a PVPK model to predict uh, biodistribution of spions in mice and humans, and also to try and develop a, a, an experimental approach to measure the uptake of nanoparticle macrophage to inform our PVPK model. So just to summarize the methods, we synthesized the, the nanoparticle, uh, uh, which are coated with oleic acid and PEG, and they have a uh, a, a diameter of 168 nanometers. Uh, uh, then we quantify the spion uptake in, in primary macrophage at different concentration and different time points. And we have integrated the findings of the, uh, these experiments in, in a mathematical uh, model describing anatomical and physiological processes defining PK and also using previously published uh, uh, data to, for example, describe penetration through capillary. And then we compare the results of our models with uh, in vivo uh, accumulation uh, uh, studies of spions in, in, in mice receiving three different doses of, of spions. 
So starting from a very basic description of, of the model, so we have a multi-compartimental model where we describe the passive diffusion of the nanoparticle through capillaries, uh, as well as the uptake of nanoparticle in spleen, liver, and lungs by macrophages using experimental data. And then we also uh, include a, a, a passive release function that has been described before for, uh, for this type of spleens. Uh, in order to, uh, to have a better description of biodistribution. And also we included uh, two uh, uh, differential equations to describe urinary excretion and biliary excretion of nanoparticles. This is just a, a, a graph summarizing the, uh, the experimental finding for different concentrations at different time points for the uptake of spions in primary macrophages. So we have seen a concentration and a time dependent uh, relationship, and we use these findings to calculate the intrinsic clearance for the different organs. So the assumptions that we're applying here is that macrophages, primary macrophages that we have used in our experiments are behaving like couple of cells, for example, in the liver. It's a big assum assumption, of course. Uh, but we consider, we measure the intrinsic clearance for million of, of macrophages in vitro, uh, such as microliter per minute of million of, ma of macrophages that are uh, the of the media that are cleared from the from the spions, and then we scale this up considering the number of macrophages per gram of tissue and the size of the organs that we are taking into account. Okay, and these are the results of our uh, the preliminary results that we have generated with this model. So we have real PK. Uh, in white bars and the uh, uh, simulated PK with the model. So as you can see, these are the tri three different doses, uh, 510, 1,020, and 240 microgram per mouse of spions after seven days of exposure. It was an IV dose. So we see higher accumulation in spleen, liver, and lungs, as well as quite high concentration in heart. And our model is, predicti is predicting, as expected, obviously, for the activity of macrophages, higher accumulation in spleen, uh, liver, and the lungs, and, and some other tissues that are uh, higher blood flow, for example. Then to give a better representation of this, actually, we normalized the, ex the exposure, the concentration per dose. So what you have here is the simulated spion concentration and the observed spion concentration normalized per microgram of dose, okay? So if we have a perfect fit of our model, we will have these points on the line, okay? Obviously, we don't have a perfect fit, uh, but we have a quite good prediction for four organs, spleen, lung, liver, and brain, and we have an under prediction for heart and quite high uh, over prediction for the, uh, for the kidney, okay? Then based on this model, that contain all the anatomical and physiological uh, um, uh, parameters for mice. We then change all the anatomical and physiological parameters, as well as the number of macrophage and the size of organs, and we try to represent humans. And we try to predict the theoretical disposition of spions in humans. And this is the results that we could uh, generate with our, with our model, where we've just simulated a theoretical IV dose of 100, 501 gram of spions, an exposure again of seven days, and this is a logarithmic scale, and we can clearly see a higher, we can predict a higher exposure in liver, lung, and spleen, which it would be two to three-fold higher to other organs that we have simulated in our, in our model. So the simulated pharmacokinetic of spions in, in the mouse PVPK model was quite in good accordance uh, uh, for, for with the in vivo experimental data for four out of six organs. And obviously the generation of PVPK, PVPK model for a nanoparticle is challenging because we have a partial description of the processing defining distribution of nanoparticle as well as not a suboptimal uh, experimental approach to represent all these. So it's quite difficult to generate experimental data to inform our mathematical model as we can do for, therapeutic, for, for traditional uh, drugs, for example. But in the future, PVPK modeling can actually support quite a lot of activity uh, in, in both academia and, and, and pharma uh, research. So, uh, for example, it could give a theoretical approach to risk assessment in order to reduce the use of animals and optimize the, the, the dose that we're giving to animals and the exposure and the time of exposure that. Uh, 
uh, we are actually uh, treating our animals for. And also we could use this type of model to identify correlation between nanoparticle characteristics and biodistribution, for example, if we have uh, the right data set to inform our modeling uh, approach. So the way we're using all this in Liverpool uh, is actually quite, uh, quite effective. So we are trying to identify clinical priorities and potential use of uh, nanoparticle to improve uh, therapies, especially in the infectious disease area at the moment. And obviously we then synthesize nanoparticles in order to try and improve PK of our drugs and, and, and for example, treatment for our patients. We develop a, a broad range of in vitro experimental approach to characterize the, the behavior of our nanoparticle, for example, for oral absorption, and then we input, we input this data in mathematical model to predict PK. And we have done this not just with spheres, but we are working on lysosomes, on solid lipid nanoparticles, solid drug nanoparticles uh, that perhaps are releasing drugs over time, uh, and, and so they have a different type of application compared to uh, spheres. And then we try to validate our mathematical model against animal models, uh, where we describe by distribution in order then to uh, uh, have effective and potentially innovative treatments uh, for patients in the future. And I leave you with some acknowledgement, uh, especially for our collaboration in Brazil that we are responsible for the synthesis of, of, the, of the spians and, and our, my colleagues in Liverpool that were very supportive for the development of mathematical models. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the presentation. I wanted to ask you what, which are the parameters uh, from a nanoparticle perspective that you are including in the models that you are developing? Uh, because uh, a magnetic particle is quite different from a solid lipid nanoparticle and a polymeric nanoparticle, so you have the size, the zeta potential, but are there other parameters that you are considering? So, so surely there are some physical chemical parameters that we are considering. Then in the case of solid drug nanoparticle, of solid lipid nanoparticle, we include release rate of the drugs. So if you are thinking about uh, uh, application for oral administration, what we are doing at the moment, we are running experiments to describe the release rate in intestinal buffer. And then we run other experiments to measure uh, uh, apparent permeability in CACO2 cells of both drugs and nanoparticles. So we have the description not only of the nanoparticle, but also of the drug released in the intestinal buffer. And then uh, uh, if the nanoparticle is thought to, to uh, reach the systemic circulation, we then apply uh, specific parameters for the description of the uh, biodistribution of the nanoparticle as well as the drug. So it depends on your application and, and which uh, route of administration you're trying to develop. Uh, then obviously uh, we have a lot of unknowns. And when you have a lot of unknowns, for example, we don't know if a given nanoparticle can penetrate through the capillaries, uh, obviously we try different scenarios fitting different parameters in order to have a better description of, of biodistribution. Thanks. Uh, first of all, I have a comment concerning your uh, results slide with the line of identity. Afterwards, I ha also have a question. Uh, there you show that you have, uh, you interpreted that you have a perfect fit for this one group where the, you, ha you see a lot of uh, uh, accumulation and then the one uh, organ where you have very low and the, ki uh, the kidney was down below and then the, the heart was uh, underestimated and uh, it's difficult to say that I think because it was b both were x and y axis were logarithmic scale and you have like a connection between two points and that and and it's easy to draw a straight line between two points right um, so um, but my question is related uh, to uh, the underestimation of the accumulation in the heart and uh, I'm wondering whether you have any ideas wh wh where this is coming from okay so yeah, you, you, are, you, are, you are perfectly right about the, the 
poor, the, the, the poor prediction of certain tissues. That, that line wasn't fitted. That line is the, the line for perfect prediction. So if the prediction would be perfect, the points would be on that line, but we didn't fit that line through the points, okay? So if I can go, if I can go back and show you that again. Uh, too many animations, sorry. But my students love it, so it's a very good uh, strategy to keep, keep them awake. So, so yeah, that line would be the line of perfect fit, so we didn't fit the line through. The, uh, and the two uh, dotted lines are actually uh, 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 two-fold, or 0.5-fold uh, difference, okay? Then you are, you're perfectly uh, right. There is a, a, a poor prediction for certain tissues, and now we are, qui we are running other experiments to have more data uh, to actually compare our prediction against real data. Uh, uh, about the heart, um, it could be a contamination from blood, uh, but spions accumulation in heart has been described before. Uh, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure which are the mechanisms, but there have been some other types of spions with different coating and different uh, characteristics that uh, show an accumulation in, in cardiac tissue. I have never worked with these models, but I have followed them for many years, and my impression is that uh, they fit well for some substances, especially if you have something good to compare with on beforehand, and they don't fit well for other compounds. And as you show here, it fit well for some tissues, but not for other tissues. But how can you trust such simulations before you have the final answer? So. Um, you're, you're entirely right, uh, and that's, that's the risk and the beauty of using PPK modeling, okay? So at the moment, is it, the risk is of using it simply as a predictive tool without enough validation. So what we are trying to uh, apply is a circle of validations against animal models in order to understand better the biodistribution of specific nanoparticles. And also, also we have to take into account that there is such a large variability of nanoparticles, and you are perfectly right. Different nanoparticles are gonna behave in different ways, and you need personalized PPPK models for different nanoparticles. So the challenge is, is big, and that's why we need to do a lot of research in this area to validate and, and develop good PPPK models. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> regarding your point that for some substances these models uh, work very well and for others they don't, there is an answer to that, um, how to uh, actually find models that describe the reality pretty well for these substances and that is largely dependent on the distribution model that you are choosing. So there is, a, well, a small zoo of uh, five or six different distribution models that you can use and experience can tell you when your model does not really describe the reality for this substance. You can go to a different distribution model that fits better to the characteristics and the physical chemistry, chemistry of this substance class. So you can go and instead of uh, using a Rogers and Rowland model in, in that part, a Poulin and Tyre model, for example. So uh, there is the possibility with some experience working with that, uh, picking something that will describe the real data well enough so that you can go and uh, use this for predictions as well. Can, can I just start? My point is just that then you need the real data before you can make the exact model. You cannot make the model be, be, uh, before you know metabolism and everything and then expect that to be the truth in the, in the body. Now, m m maybe, maybe there is a bit, uh, a, a, sm a small uh, m misunderstanding that uh, the experimental data we are including in the model are coming from ex vivo or in vitro approaches. There is nothing or just minimal parameters coming from the animal in this case. And also another aspect that has to take into account that for traditional drugs, small molecules, models have been validated for years. And nowadays, 95% of the models don't have any data coming from animal and humans as far as the drug is, uh, is concerned. So uh, all the data are from in vitro. So we'll see how this will work out in the next years. And if we can then just use our in vitro data that we have on all the papers and then just throw it at your uh, throw it at your uh, machine and then we get out what, what will be in the, in, in the mice. Uh, so thank you very much, Mr. Zikari.
Uh, so the next and last speaker uh, is uh, 